Hello, and welcome back to ByzantineChant.org. I'm again Nicholas Jones, and we'll be continuing our track through Byzantine Chant. Now, to recap some things that we learned last time, we went through a melody, we began to learn some rhythm, specifically the clasm of the sideways apostrophe that adds a beat to notes, along with aptly, diply, and triply, which also add beats to, to, the, to the note. And then here's our scale that we deal with, mi, pa, vuga, vi, ke, zo, ni. And here's some of the symbols that we've learned thus far, specifically dealing with up for the moment. We learned the ison, which is go up zero, the oligon, which is go up one, and then we have the unstressed and the stressed syllable as well. We learned how to jump up two, uh, where we have two different ways of writing this, depending upon where the melody goes. And we also have the stress symbol for going uh, jumping up two. Uh, now we're going to delve into two different sections of, of going up notes, just more more jump up symbols, and I'm going to throw a lot of symbols at you right now, mostly because uh, we have a cheat sheet online where you can kind of look through these, but there's nothing really new that's being added, just different ways of representing different jumps. So in order to jump up three notes, otherwise known as a fourth, uh, we have this symbol combination where we have the olig oligon and we have the kentimatos uh, on top this time instead of on the bottom, so we bring it up to the top and then that means jump up a third. Now, for Western musicians, oftentimes we can call this a third, uh, or a fourth, or a fifth. Uh, the problem here is that then, is it a major or minor third? Is it a, a, a per fourth? Is it an augmented fourth? Is it a diminished fourth? So then, rather than doing that, because these scales don't deal with Western intervals, instead we'll say, jump up three notes from where you were. Uh, so instead of going, I need a gun, saying that's a fourth, we say jump up three notes, so we go from knee, one, two, three, and this is the fourth note from there, so one, two, three, four. Um, so that would make it a fourth. Uh, now with this one, we replace the oligon with a patastis to make it a fluttered symbol. So then we change the execution to have a flutter and also to be stressed. And then in order to go up four notes, we add a new symbol, which is the ipsilis, uh, and we add that on top of an oligon. And then if it's on the right-hand side, then it means Go, jump up four notes, or a fifth. Uh, if it's on the left-hand side, then we drop up five notes, or we go up a sixth. And similarly, the same way that we replace the oligon here with the patastis to add a flutter or a stress, same way we just replace it here. Now, if we go even further, uh, we can start combining the kentimatos and the ipsilis and the oligon, and then we can get, jump up uh, six notes, which would be a seventh. Um, and here we have this, where we have the uh, essentially the symbol that we had for plus three, except now we've added the ipsilis. And then if we replace the oligon with the petastis, we again get a stress symbol or a flutter. And if we put the ipsilis on top, then we see uh, that we get an octave, uh, up seven notes or up an octave. And then again, rep replacing the petastis or the oligon with the petastis to change the character of the symbols. Now that we've mentioned many of the up symbols, and remember to go to our cheat sheet when you're looking through music, because eventually they'll become second nature, but at the moment they aren't. Now we'll go through the down symbols. Now in the red box here is what we've already gone through so far. Uh, so then we have the apostrophos, which is down one, and if you want to put a flutter onto it, you, you put the petastis beneath it. Again, petastis just acting as a qualitative symbol. The diaphragm means down two, or jump down a third. Uh, again, putting the petastis beneath it, and we have the iberois, which technically means down and down, and two apostrophos uh, together combine into one syllable. Uh, now, if you imagine that the alaphron ate an apostrophos and had it in its stomach, uh, then you would get this combination symbol, which means two and one together, which means minus three. So then we have jumped down a fourth there. And again, if you put a petastis beneath it, you have the fluttered symbol or a stressed symbol. Uh, now we introduce the hamilis, uh, which is a new symbol again, but this one essentially just means jump down a fifth or jump down four notes. So we would go from V to Ni, uh, which would be one, two, three, four. And then again, putting the pedestes beneath it. Uh, now if we begin to uh, add combinations of symbols, we have the hamilis uh, added to the apostrophos, which we just add minus one to this, which makes it minus, minus five. If we add the diaphragm, we add uh, minus 2 to minus 4, which gives us minus 6, so the math works out, which is very good. Uh, and then if we add uh, the minus 4 with a minus 1 with a minus 2, then we get minus 7, and this is our jump down the octave. 
Uh, and then again, with all these symbols, we just add the pathestes beneath it um, to add the fluttered symbol. Now we'll begin discussing some rhythmic symbols, since we've pretty much established all of the uh, jumping symbols that, that we'll need for the moment. Now we've already looked at the clasma and the apli, diply, and triply, uh, so those add a beat or add multiple beats to a note. Now we need to know how to decrease a note's length. So we have the gorgon, the digorgon, and the trigorgon. I so you know one, two, and three. Uh, now what this essentially means, and a lot of this, uh, a lot of the information I'll be giving you here is more practical and not necessarily the, the theory behind it, but how I've learned to understand these and how to uh, little mnemonic devices for how to remember these. Starting with the gorgon, we have one point divided into two. So we know that this one has something to do with one half. This one is two points divided into three. We know this one has something to deal with two thirds. And then the tree gorgon has three points divided into four. So we know that one has something to do with four, three fourths. Now the problem with uh, Byzantine notation and rhythm is that it doesn't operate in the same way that Western music operates. In fact, the Western music normally we see a note, let's say a quarter note, with a dot on it. So then we know that that's one and a half beats. Uh, Byzantine notation, it's always retroactive. So you see it on a note after which it should, it should have already uh, started happening. And to explain this, because it can get a little bit confusing, we'll have a few examples. So, let's say we put an E on, and we have an oligon after it. And then let's say we put the gorgon on top, we can also put it on the bottom. Um, so we see the, the ison, and then we think, oh, it's one beat. But in fact, the oligon said, the, with the gorgon on top, the gorgon says, take one, and a, a one half of a beat off of the note that it sits on, and the previous note. So the, the gorgon makes the oligon one half, because it takes off a half of a beat, and then it also makes the ison one half. Okay? So then it's retroactive, it acts on the previous note, whatever precedes it. Uh, now if we were to deal with the digorgon, if we have the same thing, now we put it on top. Now the digorgon takes two-thirds away from the note it sits on, making this one-third of a beat. The previous note, one-third of a beat, and then the note after it. So we'll just add another oligon there, and that one is also one-third. Now, you might wonder, why does it take off the previous note? Uh, now, my, my major understanding with this is that since Byzantine music is all about word painting and it's all about the words, the music is, is pretty much secondary and it's there to emphasize the words. Um, when you're reading music, you should always be reading ahead, reading the note, uh, the next note that you have to sing, or at least reading the next note, if not reading, you know, the next line, so that you are never unfamiliar with what you're going to sing. You're always uh, one step ahead of what you're supposed to, to be singing. So, in this way, if you're not reading ahead, you're going to be wrong. Because when you see this note, you should already be here and know that this is going to be one half. If you're reading this note, you should already be here and know that this is going to be one third, and that this note will be one third. So, it's kind of... Byzantine notation is forcing you into reading ahead and telling you, you should be doing this anyway, so it's going to kind of push you ahead and make you do what it wants you to do. Uh, now, if we have the tree gorgon, uh, now we can just go down here, and now, instead of having three notes that affect, we have four notes. So we go there, and again, all of these, they only affect one symbol ahead of them, before them, uh, but they affect either no symbols after them, one symbol, or this one affects two symbols. So this one would take three quarters away. So making this one one quarter, one quarter, Again, one quarter and one quarter. Now, the Western notation equivalents of these are, it makes these two half notes, or, or eighth notes, rather. It makes this a triplet, because all of these take a one beat, and it makes all these sixteenth notes. So we've begun to introduce rhythm a little bit. Now we'll go further, just, just for practical examples, to kind of demonstrate what, what the, the gorgon means, and what, how it combines with plasma and things like that. So, let's, let's just do that. Well, let's add, uh, let's say an ison. Let me put a chiasma on top of it. 
And then we put an oligon afterwards, and this time we'll put, let's say, libergon underneath. Now, this operates because we said that it takes a half a beat off the note it sits on. So that we know that the oligon is going to be a half a beat. Now, this symbol here is two beats because we, we put a classical on top, which makes it two beats. But the gorgon takes a half a beat away, so this one will be one and a half beats. So, one, two, end. Okay, so now, if we were to add, uh, let's say, the D gorgon on top, it takes away two-thirds, making this one a third of a beat, and it takes away two-thirds from this one, which was two beats, making this one and a third, and then we have to add something, let's say we have the apostrophos, and now that one's going to be one-third. So the one, two, and a... Da, 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 da. So we have a triplet there. So we've seen some combined symbols before. I, we've seen these two in particular. And we've, so this is the oligon with the kentimaton on top. This is the kentimaton with the oligon on top. Uh, now some people might say, like, what's the difference? They pretty much do the same thing. Except we've already told you before that this one will start a new syllable, most likely. This one can't start a new syllable because we read from bottom up. So we read the kentimaton first, which has to be allied to a previous symbol. Now let's say we wanted to add rhythm to this. So we'll add the gorgon up here. And we'll add the gorgon there. Now these operate in two different fashions, because as we've seen before, we have the oligon, and we have the, the kentimaton. And here, we have the kentimaton, followed by the oligon. Now the one thing to know about the gorgon is that Whenever it's in some sort of symbol combination with the kentimaton, it will always sit on the kentimaton. So here, we put it there, and here we put it there. Uh, so then, as we've just demonstrated before, it would make the kentimaton one half, and it would make here the oligon one half, because it takes a half a beat off the note it sits on, and a half a beat off the previous note. Here, the oligon is one beat, because there's no gorgon after it because the gorgon sits on the kentimaton, but it makes the kentimaton one half, and whatever note precedes it, a half, it takes off a half a beat as well. So let's say we put an is on here, and then we put our is on here, we would make our is on one half as well. And if we put an is on there, and we put the is on there, so, there's two different ways to execute this. We have la la la, one, two, end. Whereas this is la, one, and two. So these have two separate functions based upon where the rhythm sits in this combination symbol. Now before we leave for today, we'd like to bring in one more symbol combination that's new to us. And that would be this symbol combination right here. Now we've seen the apostrophos, we've seen the anaphron, but if we put them together, and most of the time if, if they touch, it forms a new symbol combination. And this is a different rhythm, uh, which we've just been learning, uh, with the gorgons. Uh, so, for example, we'll use our iperoes. So if we put a gorgon on top, if we put a symbol on top, it means it acts on the first of the apostrophos in that symbol. So if we have and ison here with iparoes with the gorgon, it means this. We have ison with apostrophos with the gorgon on top, followed by another apostrophos, making this one one half, making the one before it one half, and this one is one. Alright, now the thing is here is, is we can't put another syllable here because where will it where will it sit? Um, so we have if we start on vu, let's say. Then, one and two. So, we wouldn't start a new syllable on this one. What if we wanted to go, then he... Now we have the synechis alaphron, which is what the symbol here is called. So, here we have the ison, and then we actually have some sort of little resting place here where we can put a syllable. So we can put, then he, which, when written, exploded here looks exactly like this one. But, we can put a syllable here, and we can put a syllable here. Again, one half, one half, and one. 
So these two symbol combinations here essentially mean the same thing rhythmically. But when we're dealing with texts, they mean different things because now we can put syllables at this specific location. So, for ByzantineChen.org, I'm Nicholas Jones. Thanks for joining us.